Hey there. We're going to take a look at a song that I just posted a cover tune of. It's called Wreck Me by Charlie Crockett. Um, if you don't know him, check him out. Um, he's a country singer. I use that term loosely because he draws from influences. Um, he spent a lot of time in New Orleans. So he's got a lot of jazz, R&B, soul uh, influences as well as traditional country. So he's got that whole Texas twang country crooner vibe. Um, but as we're going to see in songs like this, he uses really sophisticated hip um, jazz harmony and songwriting techniques um, and R&B tricks. Um, and that's why people love him. That's why people love his songs and his songs sound timeless because they, you know, people have been using these same chord progressions that come from early jazz music and Broadway show tunes and Gershwin tunes. And they've been using these chord progressions, you know, all the way through the Beatles, you know, you know, uh, if you listen to Chris Stapleton, you know, he uses these kind of chord progressions. So a lot of famous bands and musicians outside of the rock and blues genre um, use these things that we're going to be discussing in this lesson. So don't dismiss it because it's a country song. There's a lot to learn um, in this song. And it's things that we've been talking about. So it builds on the lesson on chords within a major key, um, we're going to be talking about the relative minor. It's used in this chord. We're going to be talking about a very cool topic that I mentioned earlier called secondary dominance, uh, a chord substitution. So some really hip stuff. You know, we even are going to sneak in a 2-5-1. Remember we talked about that, that kind of like standard jazz progression. We're going to sneak a 2-5-1 into a country tune, you know. So... Um, stick with it and try to, you know, get what you can from this song. It's a, in my opinion, it's a really great teaching moment and teaching tool. It's also in the key of C, so there's no sharps or flats, so it's super easy. Well, let me give you an addendum on, let me clarify that. Um, it's capoed at the first fret. All it does is it you know, bars the fret, so you can play your E chord, right, or your A chord, or your C chord, but instead of being a C, it's now a C sharp, right, because you went up one fret. If you want to play a D, you'd move the, move it up there, one more fret, and you'd be playing your C shape on D. So, if you don't have a capo, you can still benefit from this lesson. And I'll pop this off for a second. So the song is in C sharp. And that's what we're going to play. I'm going to play with a capo. So that way, if you want to play along with the recording, um, Charlie Crockett soon, then it's going to be in C sharp. Um, but you can learn this in open tuning. Just playing, right? Instead of a C sharp, a C. Instead of A sharp minor, a minor instead of E sharp seven, E seven. It's the exact same chord shapes, just moved down a half step. So you can play this whole song in open position. Take what I show you with the capo, and if you don't have a capo, just apply it to the open strings, okay? And get the theory out of it that way. But get yourself a cable, you know? They're really handy. And you know, if you're gonna learn singer-songwriter stuff and country or bluegrass stuff, or even some blues, right? We had talked about, we did a lesson on Mean Old World. And in those songs, um, they were tuned to an open chord, to open tuning, and they had a capo at the third fret. You know, so a, if you're going to play acoustic, 
Uh, a capo is a pretty handy tool. Don't believe people who say that capos are cheating. That's just, those are the same people who would tell you you don't need music theory. You know, everybody's got an opinion. So I, I'm going to show you a real quick chord chart that I knocked out for this song. Let me get it on the camera. Boop, boop. You can kind of freeze it and take a look at that, right? That's what we're going to be working on. And I find it very helpful to have a chord chart to visually guide myself, you know, through the song. Whenever I learn a song, it's the first thing I do is write out a chord chart, you know. And that's with a band or whatever, you know. I, How else am I going to keep track of the song? Just memorize every chord? You know, that doesn't work well for me, okay. Um, plus, when I write out the chords, I can then analyze them. I can see them and I can go, oh, well, that's the six, and that's the two, and that's the five, and that's the one. And once I know that, I can play it in any key because it's just a six, two, five, one. And I just move that up to a different key, six, two, five, one, six, two, five, one, up and down the neck. So once you've analyzed a chord progression and you already have that progression under your fingers, you can move it up and down the neck and play it in any key. So again, good reason to learn theory. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of this song. It's in the key of C. If you look at that chord chart, um, I have two measures of rest. Um, I think the song, it depends on who, the, what version you're looking at. Um, I've seen some charts start with like a quarter note rest and then the, the chords. Um, I purposely wrote it so that the chord comes in on the one and there's two bars of intro and then that allows me to have nice clean layouts of the verse and then the chorus. Verse and then the chorus, right? So kind of like the verse starts at the beginning of one line, chorus starts at the beginning of another line. And when you chart things out in four bar blocks, um, whether it's a eight bar tune, 16 bar tune, 12 bar tune, 32 bars, you're gonna see this nice evenness between the verses, choruses, bridge, you know. Um, there, I'm gonna point out a little funkiness in this. You know, it just is what it is on this song. So right here, right? Sorry, I'm doing this backwards. So right here, there's a they sneak in a D minor. This is where the two, five, one happens. Um, so notice I put like these two quarter notes in there. That's to show myself that that chord is only played for two beats. It's really weird. In the bridge, um, we go from this push of a two chords every measure. Boom, 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 boom. And then it opens up in the bridge. Boom, boom. But then it goes to this D minor. Boom. Then G. Two, three, four. So there's a, you just be aware that there's only two beats in that measure. Um, let's talk about symbols real quick. If you're not familiar with chord charts, um, this is a repeat, right? This symbol, you play from this one down to that one, and then you repeat, okay? And then after you would repeat it, so you'd play it two times, then you would go to the bridge, right? And you play through the bridge. And at the end of the bridge, it says DS. And that means um, to the sign, del seno. And this is the sign, this little S with the dots on the line through it. And that's right at the top of the first verse. So I use the, generally, use the DS as a means in charting to get me back to the top of the song. So then I would play through it again, right? Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, right? Because it's got the repeats. Then it says right here, to Al Coda. 
So the second time through, right, we go, we play it two times, then we go to the bridge, then we play it two times, that's the second time through, then al coda, to the coda. And that's this circle with a cross through it. So, and that moves us to the outro of the song, which is just still the C, A minor, okay? But um, there's no singing over it. And the song, the original, just fades out on that. It just fit, does that in, for a bunch of measures and fades out. But when I was listening to the song and singing along with it and learning it, um, I didn't want to just fade it out. I wanted to have a, a definitive ending. So I added, you know, that little ending where I, I sang um, and just kind of repeated the uh, chorus. Like you do. Like you do. Like you do. Like you do. So that's my ending that I tagged on there, give it my own spin on the song. So let's start at the top. We're in the key of C. Refer to your chart if you want to. It's 4-4 four, four time, common time, capo on the first fret. So while we are technically playing a C sharp and an A sharp, etc., I'm going to call out the standard open chord shapes. So I'm just gonna call out a C. So you're gonna play the C shape, right? There's your bar, C shape. Don't worry about what note it's on. It's on a C sharp, but C shape, okay? A minor shape. Now, in the key of C, A minor is the sixth, the relative minor. We've been talking about that. I've been hinting at this for a while. Now you're gonna hear it in action. So. The reason the relative minor works so well with the root, um, we have to take a look at the chord tones. Um, in the C, remember we have no sharps or flats. And the way I remember chord tones is I have two methods. One is ace G, A, C, E, G. So if you have a A chord, like we have an A minor chord, and we're in the key of C, so there's no sharps or flats, so the chord tones of that chord are going to be A, C, E, and G. Ace, G. Now, all chord tones repeat. So A, C, E, G, right? Start on the third. C, E, G, B. Now we have the chord tones for the C chord. C, E, G, B. Now, if we started on the third of that, um... C, E, G, B, E, G, B, D. Remember our E dominant seven chord? E, G, B, D. And then we go to the third of that, right? And we would see them repeat again. G, B, D, F sharp, okay? So the other method I have of, of remembering chord tones is when I was in the army um, the mess hall, the chow hall, was called officially the dining facility. And it had a big sign on it with DFAC, D-F-A-C. And that's the chord tones for the D. D-F-A-C. And then F is the word face. F-A-C-E. Which then gets me back to my A. A and I have H-G. A-C-E-G. So the C chord... C, E, G, B, right? C, E, G, B shares chord tones with the sixth chord. A, C, E, G, right? The bottom, the top three chords, top three chord tones, sorry, of the A minor, right? C, E, G are the bottom three chord tones of the C major. 
So that's why they sound so good together. And they, um, you can work between the major and the relative minor because three quarters of the chord, of each chord, it has the same chord tones. So what you're gonna hear here is uh, what some musicians, it's, it's an old term, I don't know if people still use it, but you know, like when I was in music school and stuff, session players would call it a push. When you go between two chords, just back and forth, rocking back and forth, they would call it a push between the one and the six. Or they'd say, hey, push from the one to the six, or push, push from the one to the four. I don't know if people still use that, but it's stuck in my head that that's what this is called. Mm -hmm. So it's like your one, you're gonna play the one for two beats, one, two, and then on the three, you're gonna play the six chord, the A minor. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. C major, A minor. One chord, six chord. Major of the key, relative minor, okay? The rhythm for the song really accents those um, one, the upbeats. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, it doesn't do a lot of like that strumming. It's real down picking. You could do it up picking if you kind of want that. Kind of more R&B, Steve Cropper. But if you want it to be more country, country blues, keep with the down picking. And here I'm just putting in those palm mutes in between because I'm just keeping that beat. I'm playing by myself, right? There's no drummer. So I'm filling it out. And it also helps me keep in time. You know, instead of just playing with all that space in between it. Um, I want that rhythm. I want that chug. to drive the song. Even though it's a ballad, right? This song is technically kind of up-tempo. It's like, I don't know, like 68 beats per minute or something right, right around there. Now, you have that driving kind of rhythm in the verse, and then when we go to the chorus, let's talk about the chorus, right? We've been playing C, A minor, minor then it's going to push between the four chord which is the f instead of going down here and trying to you know get this f down here i just play the higher f up here it's much easier and i just like it sounds better it sounds like it's a clearer sounding chord it cuts through better f c f f sorry c f same rhythm Right? So it does F, C twice, and then it does F, G, goes to the five, and stops. It has a quarter note rest, and you'll hear it when the song comes to a stop. Um, while you wreck me, while you wreck me, while you wreck me, G, C. So, that G is the five. It wants to resolve to the C, even though we're not playing a dominant chord there, it's still the five chord. The, you know, the G is the five. So we've played one, six, one, six, one, six, four, one, four, one, four, five. And then back to one, six, one, six. That is the chord progression for the verse and the chorus, okay? Um, let's look at the bridge. Now we're going to see something cool. We're going to get into what is called secondary dominance. We're playing in the key of C, 
So we know our dominant chord, our five chord, is G, right? Or we could play G7. Now, a secondary dominant is when you take a chord from another key. It's the fifth of a chord you want to go to. And you can suspend the harmony of a song this way because it's all about where you're headed. It's not about the chord you're on. It's about the chord you're resolving to. So that allows us to sneak in a dominant chord from another key to set up a chord that we're moving towards. So um, we start with the bridge, right? We're playing the C to A two times after the second verse, or second chorus. And then it goes to E7. Right? Now, we're in the key of C. E is the three, the third chord. And we know from our previous lesson that the third chord is minor. So this should be a minor chord or a minor seven chord, right? It should be E minor. It shouldn't be E7, but we're not worried about the E. What we're going to is the A minor in the next bar. The A, what's the fifth of A? E, E7, right? So that E7 is the secondary dominant of the sixth chord, the A. It would be called a five of six, right? It's the five of the sixth chord. So it's setting up the tension, which is, remember, music's all about tension and release. So we've been, for two verses and two choruses, we've been, just sinking in that key signature, that sound of C. And then all of a sudden, oh, tension, resolve. But then it does it again. It goes to the D7 up here after the A minor. It goes to the D7, which in the key of C, D would be the two chord. And we know the two chord is minor as well. So it's creating a secondary dominant to set up the next chord, which is G. Okay, so what's the five of G? D7. So that D7 is setting up the G, right? But here's where that little two beat D minor sneaks in, right? Um, we could have just played D7, right, to the G. But Charlie Crockett wanted to throw a little jazz in there. So he, he pulled it back into the key, into the C, right? Because this D7 is in the key of G. But then he went to the D minor, which is in the key of C. It's the two chord. Right? And then the G is the five chord. And that leads us out of the bridge, back into the verse, onto the one chord, a two, five, one. Two, five, one. Pretty hip. So we have two secondary dominants, the E7, moving to the A minor, and then the D7, that's moving to the G, but it makes a D tour to the D minor and then goes to the G. Now I've just been playing the G, but you could also play G7. That's what's on the chart. Um, but I've seen it, like if you look online, I've seen G, I've seen G7, I've seen um, G to G7, you know. But when I listen to the song, what I hear is a G triad. I don't hear the seventh in that chord. Um, I could be wrong. You know, my ears could be off. So I wrote a G7 on the chart um, because that's what most of the chord charts that I've seen use. And it's no big deal. The G major is the bottom triad, the one, three, five of the G7 chord. Right, the dominant chord, you're just adding the minor seven on top. 
So it's you're not doing anything wrong by playing the G. And actually, by, in my opinion, my estimation, by playing the triad and not the seventh chord, you're giving it more of a country sound, right? You're giving it that more folksy Americana vibe than a dominant chord, right? Vibe. Plus, you've just had two dominant chords in that bridge, right? And then this dominant chord. Come into that G. Right? So I just didn't want to play another dominant chord. That G triad still sets up the C. Okay? So now we've gone through the verse, chorus, twice. Gone through the bridge. Now we go back up to the top. Play the verse. Four bars of C to A minor. And then it goes to F, C, C, sorry, F, C, F, G, G with a stop. And then to C. And that's where that little, like, yodel is. I have no idea what to call that. I, I grew up in the Ozarks, or I have a lot of family. I grew up, I was born in St. Louis, but you know, I have a lot of family in Southern Illinois, and a lot of family in Southern Missouri. So we would travel uh, through the country and all you get is either fire and brimstone preachers, or you would get old time country music, bluegrass music, hillbilly music. So I just have, when I sing country tunes, my hillbilly accent, my Ozark accent comes out and that little lilt, that little voice break, that yodel um, that is in those verses. And Charlie Crockett does it. He does it in some versions, in some versions he doesn't. Um, I don't know. You know, there's no way to explain those breaks. They're improvised. Um, I just hear a sound in my head and I go for it and break the voice. But that's where that happens, is on that, um, that G. La, ha, ha, you do. And then the ending is just um, three more bars of the C minor. If you want to fade it out, you know, I just did it with that, that vocal, like you do, like you do, like you do, and then ending on a big C, like you do, you know, got to find some way to end the song. So that's Wreck Me from Charlie Crockett and a lot of cool stuff. We learned the relative minor, how it applies to the major chord. We learned secondary dominance, right? And we learned a new song. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I hope you all got something out of it. And I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for stopping by.